billion individuals in the United States. Each one is unique. Each one is a complex personality and lives in a complicated life situation. Each varies from the other in age, race, religion, social class, and personal preferences. Each has needs, feelings, dreams, and personal problems. These individuals form different kinds of groups for different purposes. They interact in different ways. Familiar groups are the family, the church, the baseball team, and the square dancing club. Other groups are larger and more formal, such as the American Medical Association, Girl Scouts of America, or the American Civil Liberties Union. Obviously, these are different kinds of groups and have different kinds of functions. Part of the task of sociology is the study of these groups, their formation, purpose, and activities. But its scope is broader than that. All of the quarter of a billion individuals in this country face problems in their real-life situations. The problems often vary with age, race, sex, and social class. Some problems are almost universal. Life cycle changes, such as passing through puberty or growing old, energy shortages, sickness and dying. Other problems are more individual in nature. How to meet the needs of a deaf child, or how to cope with a neighbor who bangs on his old car late at night. Individuals respond to their problems in different ways. Some find solace in religion. Some find refuge in drugs. Some seek escape in sex or some other form of pleasure. And still others choose to solve problems through political action or social service. But whatever the problems, whatever the method chosen for responding to them, each person needs to identify personally with what is happening in the world to understand the forces that shape that person's time. Part of the task of sociology is to give the individual a broader perspective, to provide an understanding of underlying realities and patterns at work in society. This, then, is the promise of sociology, to enable the individual to grasp the interplay between history and that person's own biography, and to see how the sweep of history intersects with that person's life in society. Sociology is interested in the big picture, Individuals studying sociology can find themselves in that big picture in hundreds of ways and in many different circumstances. To do so requires a special skill, what the late sociologist C. Wright Mills called the sociological imagination. It's a point of view, a perspective, which helps individuals determine what is happening in the world and thus better understand what is happening within themselves. Mills calls it the intersection of history and biography the location of the individual in that person's own time and culture. In order to make use of Mill's concept of the intersection of history and biography, it's helpful to examine briefly some of the signs of our times and the historical context which gave rise to the world as we know it. In 1976, on the 200th anniversary of this nation's independence, a poll was taken of top news decision makers on the top 20 news stories in United States history. The results were, first, the American Revolution, second, drafting the Constitution, third, the Civil War, fourth, World War II, fifth, the Moonshot, sixth, atomic energy, and so forth. It's important to note that these news stories involve politics, war, technology, economics, all events and processes that are far too complex and removed from everyday life for the ordinary person to understand or control. Sociology focuses light on the impact of these great events on human behavior and human values, in addition to its task of interpreting the meaning of everyday activities in the life of every person. 
sociology also serves a useful function in the examination of the context of our times. Living adults can remember grandparents who were born in 1850 and thus were teenagers in the Civil War. These same adults will retire from work in the year 2000. The generations born in 1850, 1900, and even 1930 in the United States were all born in an essentially rural nation before television, plastic, jets, and ballpoint pens. And from 1850 to 1930, there was very little change in the way many people heated and lighted their houses, cooked their meals, educated, and entertained themselves. Religious truths and community relations were rarely reinterpreted. But the years 1930 to 1950 were a watershed in the cultural development of the United States. The impetus was the big war. It brought people to the cities to work in wartime factories. It took millions of men and women overseas to experience other cultures, to leave home for years, and to come home to children they had never seen. In its aftermath came the GI Bill and adult education. Then came the suburbs, such as Levittown. Post-war production changed to consumer goods, and with that came consumer credit and other innovations in the economic and social spheres. People born in 1950 or later were born in an urban world, a time of rapid change, great diversity of population, and changing social norms and values. Living adults who were born in rural America in 1930 lived in a culture not far removed from 1850 in terms of technology and cultural values. These same adults now live in cities that seem light years removed from the Civil War, or even from the pace of life in the 1930s. And even for those born in the 1940s, 50s, or 60s, change occurs so fast that confusion and bewilderment are almost inevitable. Life at every level, family, work, education, religion, has changed. Thus, the individual asks in frustration, where do I fit? What's the meaning of all that's happening around me? What's ahead for me? The average person of today and tomorrow needs an intellectual tool to use in understanding the larger scene in which that person lives. Sociology offers this tool. Sociology is a study of human behavior in groups of whatever size, from two people to a total society. The formal definition is that sociology is the scientific study of the interaction of human beings in groups, of the meanings of that interaction, and of the rules which regulate those groups and their interaction. Sociology uh, can be defined, I think, uh, appropriately as um, the scientific study of human behavior in a group context. Sociology is the scholarly study of society and social structure and all its parts like family, bureaucracy, community, and so on. Sociology is not uh, an easy or a very precise science. It's really only, uh, only a slightly more organized way of uh, using common sense. But it is an effort that has gone on now for, say, a hundred years in a serious way and therefore one can profit by looking uh, at what people who try to organize common sense about how we live together have achieved over that time. I think sociology is one of the answers to uh, Socrates' old notion about we have to know who we are. Uh, Socrates was condemned to death for asking too many philosophical questions. I like to think that if Socrates were alive today, he would be a sociologist. And he would encourage us all not only to know ourselves, but to know the kind of society in which we live. Because we are, after all, a reflection of that society. Sociology looks at the underlying patterns and the taken for granted of a total society and at the meanings attached to those patterns of behavior. The sociologist often notices and studies behavior which is so familiar or ordinary that the average person does not notice it. But that behavior is examined with special lenses. Sociologists attempt to use uh, observation and experimentation, as a natural scientist would, uh, in order to know uh, what uh, human behavior actually is. They attempt to use the positivistic or the scientific method 
to uh, come up with their conclusions about human behavior in an effort to describe that behavior, uh, simply to say what it is. And this is some of the most interesting parts of sociology, simply the description, what people actually are doing. Sociologist, I would say, first has to learn to think, uh, as we call it, empirically. You have to look at the obvious and count it. Uh, and make it more obvious. Uh, that sounds somewhat simplistic, but you have to learn to think in the context of, say, a mathematical uh, understanding that empirically, does this happen more often? Can I remove myself from this society as a, a participant and see how it moves? Uh, an example that I always use to illustrate this point is something called the Zip equation, which is particularly fascinating to sociologists. If I take the metropolitan population of American cities and rank them, if I multiply the rank times the population, it always equals the population of New York City. And it's a kind of a fascinating pattern. Uh, this is an obvious empirical thing, but you begin to look at that and say, what does this mean? Uh, why does that exist? Uh, you try to order the society and you try to assign some way of understanding that order uh, through an empirical perspective. The sociologists are interested in individuals. They want to look at individuals, and they do look at individuals. But it is how the group impinges upon the individual, the way in which the group, interactional patterns, expectations of the group, of the society, uh, of one's family, of one's church, of one's government, of one's peer group, uh, of one's uh, age cohort, uh, the way in which other people around affect the individual and how his behavior uh, interacts or uh, is, uh, is a reaction to those expectations. This is the arena in which sociologists uh, attempt to do their work. There is also an ordinary person orientation to the sociologist's work. That is, the sociologist is more interested in the behavior of ordinary people in ordinary groups than in unusual people in unusual groups. For example, a study of prostitution may make important contributions, but a study of the sexual behavior of the average woman will lend more to the understanding of human interaction because there are more of them than there are prostitutes. Thus, the notion that sociologists focus much of their attention on exotic behavior is a common misconception. There are others. The major one, I think, is that there's a general view that sociologists are ideologues. It sounds, sociology sounds an awful lot like socialism. Uh, and I run into an awful lot of people who assume that because I am a sociologist, I am, by definition, a socialist. Uh, my late grandmother went a step beyond that. She was an elderly woman when I was in college. When I became a sociology major, she asked me whether I was a Menshevik or a Bolshevik. Uh, but there is still this conception, and indeed it, it pervades the Washington area, in, in the halls of government, particularly in the Congress. I think sociologists are distrustful because they believe in the welfare state, or so it's assumed. Oh, the most common is that we are social workers, and the second most common is, of course, that we are socialists. Uh, I always love that one. Uh, somehow be a communist uh, because you were a sociologist. Uh, those are the most common misconceptions, that people think that uh, you are obviously concerned about uh, how to organize a society, or you're a Marxist, or any number of philosophical positions of that sort, which is really not uh, the case. I've even met Republican sociologists at this point. The other is that I think there, there are two images in the population of sociology and how sociologists do their work, neither of which reflects reality. One is that sociologists try to be super scientific and reduce all social life to numbers. Uh, a sense that we have been imbued with the scientific model as we get it from physics and chemistry. And I think that there's a sophisticated recognition out on the part of the American people that uh, it's not that easy to reduce people to numbers. Uh, on the other side of the coin, there's also a group of people out there who regard sociology as purely humanistic, uh, in fact, being more like the humanities than the sciences. Uh, and not being able to contribute much in terms of scientific understanding to what life is about because of that. Uh, in point of fact, I think, or at least in my view of sociology, uh, the discipline must be a mix of the two. Uh, we can't get away from trying to establish precise measurement, uh, but n neither can we get away from the basic 
fact, or what I regard as a fact, that the social sciences, social sciences must be humanistic uh, to understand the phenomena that they're trying to. Sociologists have a wide field in which to work and to research, and they involve themselves in many different topics and types of work. A general sample illustrates this. My major research for, I guess, the last eight years has been concerned with the relationship between the armed forces and American society and with military organization generally. Uh, my most recent work has focused on the issue of how a democracy can best or should best meet its military manpower needs. The issue of whether we should have an all-volunteer force, have military conscription, or indeed move to some form of universal national service where everyone does something whether or not it's military service for the nation. My major areas of interest as a sociologist are in the areas of sto social stratification. Inequality in all respects is my major area of interest. That tends to come out in two specific ways. I look at inequality between women and men and try and understand the relationships between women and men and also in the area of minority groups because the chief disadvantage that minority groups have is that they're discriminated against and live in an unequal relationship with the majority group. At the moment I am uh, working on uh, the role of uh, law, and particularly the federal courts, in affecting social institutions. Uh, I think everyone is familiar with how they've affected educational institutions, uh, desegregation, uh, the movement from uh, de bilingualism, school busing, and so on. People will become aware more and more of how they are affecting higher education through the interpretation of government regulations and so on. What I do primarily is teach. Uh, it's a major source of my identity. It's something I very much enjoy. It's uh, probably the one activity into which I put most of my energies. I do spend a fair amount of time working with various professional associations like the Society for the Study of Social Problems. I spend some amount of time doing research and doing some amount of writing. I've written a textbook and a half a dozen, 15, 20 different articles. Uh, the study I most enjoyed was a study on inequality and how people perceive the American class structure and why they do. I, as a sociologist, I uh have recently studied commitment hearings where I am concerned about how people are defined as mentally ill and what happens to them. I find that one of the consequences of alienation is sort of a, an isolation and a propensity to uh, be defined as mentally ill and being treated as mentally ill. That if you drop out of society, society tries to put you back in by sending you through therapy. Another aspect of my work in, deals with studies of drinking behavior and bar behavior. And I find that, especially among older men, that bars can be places where they try to generate a sense of community, uh, to try to make up for the alienation that occurs because they've had uh, poor work experience, because they're old, because people are rejecting them. So bars are sort of places that people can both drink away the problems of alienation as well as uh, make up for some of the problems of lack of community. As a sociologist, I think, it's a strange thing to say because I suppose in government work, uh, if we do any thinking, we're supposed to be on our own time. But in fact, uh, sociologists do a, an enormous range of, of uh, things in different government agencies. Now, the biggest single discipline or sub-discipline within which sociologists can find useful work is as statisticians and I would include there, for example, my own specialty, which was demography. The Census Bureau, where I work, employs sociologists pretty much as subject matter experts. That is, we analyze data relating to different social characteristics of the American population, but we analyze these data not only from the point of view of seeing that the numbers add up, but far more importantly is what do these trends indicate is happening to American society. Well, I, I suppose I would say I'm mainly interested in what makes for the well-being of people in society, uh, whether that's in a more intimate, in the more intimate world of the family, or in the more uh, 
objective world of income distribution, things like that. So that the, and that has informed uh, the interest of a great many sociologists over time. Uh, what makes society work so that it pays off uh, uh, for people. And for me, that means particularly being concerned with uh, problems of inequality in society, both economic inequality and racial inequality. Sociology as a discipline is concerned with people in groups, with the mass society, the culture as a whole. But it also applies the insights derived from examining those large groups to the individual. There is a payoff for the person who acquires the insights of sociology. When I uh, lecture my classes uh, on this question, I, I try to, real, uh, to deal realistically with what sociology has uh, meant to me, the way in which it has helped me as, a, as an individual. Um, I learn a great deal about what motivates me. Um, I learn a great deal about uh, how other people affect me. Uh, I learn uh, for myself uh, ways in which I can cope with a somewhat unfriendly and maybe even in some ways unworkable society. Uh, how I can, um, uh, in a sense, get through uh, uh, the day's activities uh, and uh, come out uh, sane. I'm able to stand off and see what's happening and those forces that uh, are affecting me and uh, thus uh, uh, seeing them and uh, understanding them, uh, I'm able to, uh, to cope with them and uh, maybe successfully to, uh, to get through them. I think the payoff of sociology is that it helps us to know who we are as individuals. It helps us to understand our own biography. Maybe most of all what it does is to help us to understand the kinds of social worlds in which we live so that we understand the kinds of options we have and what's involved if we want to participate in one or another kind of social change. Earlier, it was pointed out that it's the promise of sociology to enable individuals to understand better how they fit into the world around them, how to define themselves in the context of our time and place on Earth. Out of that pursuit come other questions, such as, where is society going? How can the ordinary person adapt to change? What does the future hold for the family, work, religion, education, community? Again, the concepts of C.W. Mills are helpful. Mills says that ordinary people are bounded in their awareness and actions by the private orbits in which they live. Their visions and their powers are limited to the close-up scenes of job, family, and neighborhood. This could be called level one of social reality. It's what the individual knows intimately. Work, friends, house repairs, taxes, and a dead battery in the winter. Mills says that persons who understand only what they experience firsthand often feel that life is a series of traps, that the troubles of the everyday world cannot be overcome. They're frustrated and often defeated by forces they don't comprehend and which they cannot change. Many of these forces and issues are found within another level of social reality, that which deals with the structure of entire societies, with the forces which hold a society together, make it change or keep it from changing. This includes such complex issues as unrest in the Middle East, the trade deficit, and military power on the global scale. This level of social reality is well beyond the grasp of ordinary persons. Yet they may often feel threatened by events at this level because of their vagueness and confusion. At the second level, the individual is capable of asking certain questions, which are a result of the sociological imagination. One is, what is the structure of this particular society as a whole? American society in the 1980s is still built around family and work. Both of these are in an urban, industrial, technological context. Church, school, and community are large, impersonal, and bureaucratic and do not meet the emotional, intimate needs of people. And there's an emphasis in this society on individualism and individual rights, an emphasis which sometimes weakens such institutions as education, religion, work, and family. A second key question is, where does this society stand in human history? 
This society stands at the zenith of technological development in the history of mankind. Technology has created affluence, leisure, mobility, rapid change, urbanization. It has also created pollution, increased crime, social disorganization. American society is said to be post-industrial, based on services rather than manufacturing or the production of goods. Education and information are increasingly vital. The third crucial question which arises from the sociological imagination is what varieties of men and women prevail in this society? Again, it's the educated, scientific, technical, managerial types who dominate and will continue to do so. Individuals who have access to information on computers or who can use various forms of media have power now and we can expect that power to increase. Yet for most people, there don't seem to be any straight answers. The ordinary person feels trapped and sees no light at the end of the tunnel. The person today who feels the world is crashing in because that person can't grasp the interplay of world events and changes in society will really be lost in the decades ahead unless that person develops an intellectual grasp of the complex issues in society. The promise of sociology is that light and understanding shall come upon all of these levels of human experience. That by seeing the broad structures and processes of society and locating oneself within them, the individual can possess a better understanding of what is happening in the total society and of one's own life chances in that society. The sociologist looks through the special lenses of the concepts of that discipline in order to see things which ordinary people don't see. The sociologist discovers social facts, observes rules of behavior, notes the nature and meaning of interaction in various circumstances, and studies the patterns and the taken for granted of everyday life. As the newcomer to sociology examines and becomes familiar with these new lenses, that person will begin to see shades of meaning and reasons for behavior which he had never seen before. The newcomer will understand better the social reality at all levels and will perhaps find alternatives which are more acceptable and which improve the quality of that person's life.